hello everyone check this out you don't need to know what's going on uh just just look like tell me a joke boom look at that so this, uh, it's bad, right? <laughs> it's a distill GPT-2 model. But that's not the point. The point is that I can type something and I get back a streaming response. There is a language model and as the language model generates tokens, it appears on your screen. I have modified a Hugging Face te inference server project to get that done. For doing that, I've had to go through so many different technologies in order to achieve this because Hugging Face isn't made to generate token by token and give it to you at inference time. Also, they have built this inference server for large language models that only at the very end you have the hugging face stuff. Before that, you have gRPC, you have Rust, you have all kinds of things. And then on top of that, because this is for the Open Assistant project, I wanted something where anyone in the world could provide their GPU and run such an inference server. So that means we have to have an additional layer of routing that is compatible with this streaming. So what you see right here goes from Hugging Face via gRPC, via Rust, via server sent events, via a worker Python script that connects via WebSocket to an inference backend server that queues and dequeues stuff from a Redis database. Those again being dequeued by the same server to respond to clients such as this text client or a browser again via server sent events. So whenever a token is produced, in the language model, it goes all of this way directly to the client and you don't have to wait until the very end of the generation and then you just get one block at a time. That's what we're going to build today. So some of you may know I've been working on this project called Open Assistant. Now, either there will already be a video about it or one will come out shortly. In any case, this is an open source replication of ChatGPT. Now, I'm going to show you all about it in that other video. Today is about part of that that I was interested in working on and coding up. And that is the inference pipeline. So for now, we're doing data collection. You can interact with the website and play the assistant and so on. But once we train the model, we actually want to deploy it. So you know, in chat GPT, if you enter a prompt, you get the reply in this nice streaming fashion. So token by token or word by word, we want to replicate that for one, it makes the experience more like you're chatting with a chat bot where you can interact with the bot and it's kind of, you know, typing as it goes along. On the other hand, it makes for a better user experience because you get the beginning of the message while the end is still computing. So we want to achieve that. However, current hugging face, for example, library only supports you actually generate until the end. So hugging face has a server for inference in large language models. So this here is called text generation inference. It's a repository by hugging face, and it specifically supports a bunch of the current larger models. And it also supports sort of common language models that they have on the the hub. This is about how it works. So there is a Rust web server because Python is notoriously bad where you need to multi thread. So what's the problem? The problem is that we want to serve this model here on the right hand side with requests. And this model could be sharded on different GPUs, but we want to serve it with not just one request, we want to serve it with batch of requests. So we need some sort of batching mechanism here. That means the requests that come in must somehow be pulled together into a batch in order to send to the language model, which also means that these requests are no longer independent. So there must be communication between the requests and that communication must be quick. Now in Python, if I start off a new like UVCorn web server or something like this, there is a degree of parallelism which I can reach with async IO or with different processes. I simply start a process or lots of processes that handle these requests. The reason that works is because the processes don't need to communicate with each other. They may need to lock some database or something, but there's no direct communication. If you need direct communication, you need threads because you need shared memory. And Python does not like threads. <laughs> Python, threads and high performance, not a thing. That's why I assume that this web server here is written in Rust. 
However, the whole language model code, the whole hugging face library is of course still in Python. So they need to communicate with Python via gRPC. So what we want to do is we want to modify this system. We want to add an endpoint at the left hand side that essentially says generate stream or something like this that gives you back not just one response with the result of your generation, but sort of a stream of results. And we want to do that through the whole mechanism of batching through the gRPC calls through the hugging face library all the way down until the model. So we're going to cross all of these language and technology boundaries in order to make that happen. I have actually done it. And this video is me reproducing from memory what I've done and sort of commenting it as we go along. Not only that, I've actually extended that So on the right hand side here, you see the original thing that you just saw, I have extended that to also have like this little worker thing that is now our system, the open assistant system that communicates via a web socket with an inference backend, there is again a Redis queue that schedules that so the workers could be anyone, anyone plugging in their GPU into the system giving power for inference, they would run the whole thing on the right hand side and it would probably be something like this, then communicate via web socket with the inference backend, which has a Redis system to schedule and queue the jobs and eventually get this to the user all in streaming fashion. That means the tokens come one by one, like ding, 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 from the GPU via the hugging face, via the gRPC, via the Rust server batcher, via server sent events, via this worker, via WebSocket, via the inference backend, via Redis, again, via server sent events to the user. That's it. That's what we want to do. Uh, you might not be familiar with some of these technologies. I was too much. You might know the WebSocket. So the WebSocket is sort of a bi-directional push mechanism in the web between a server and a client. It's very modern. It's when you need to go beyond HTTP requests. So you just request response. Every one of these requests requires a build up TLS handshakes, yada, yada, yada. It's textual data. A web socket, you establish the connection once and then you just push events in both directions. Very convenient. We use that here between this worker and the inference backend, not something for today. The other technology is server sent events. Now that is very similar to a web socket, but it's only in one direction direction it means the client makes one request to the server and the server instead of responding in one go, it can send events as many as it wants until the server closes the connection and then that cycle is finished and the client makes another request. That's exactly what we need in two different places. So first of all, when the user makes a request for a chat like I just did in chat GPT, that's exactly the thing I do. I send a message and then I get back the response token by token. So we use server sent events. And again, here between the worker and the web server, again, the worker sends one request to do an inference and the web server sends back these little packets of response in a streaming fashion. So our generate endpoint here, if we end up actually implementing it, it should have a server sent event response instead of HTTP response. And how we're going to handle the whole gRPC thing, we're going to see, we're going to dive into this thing right here. And the first thing we're going to do is obviously we're going to clone it, clone it, clone it. Let's switch here, git clone. Hey, let me quickly jump in and just talk to you about the fact that weights and biases has not only been really kind to my channel in the past, but they've also sponsored an entire team account to the open assistant efforts. Open assistant is not me. It's actually a big part, like a big community, lots of volunteers doing work. I'm the person here on camera, <laughs> bringing in the traffic. Weights and Biases has been super supportive to all of these people. And obviously, they're a great MLOps framework, and we're super happy to use them. So I want to thank them a lot. I want to tell you about this course they have. It's entirely free course. So if you go to 1db.courses, .courses is the top level domain, their courses are on effective MLOps. And this first one is on model development. So this is a course, as I said, it's completely free. It's not cohort based. So you can just go through it at your own pace. Here you can see a little bit of the curriculum. So it starts off with building a prototype, building a baseline, evaluating your model and going further than that. So you're not going to build the like latest and greatest large language model. This is really taking you from building a model and then the steps. How do I assess the quality of the model? How do I see even whether I can, you know, make it better? How do I treat data? How do I make things reproducible? For that, you're going to train initially a UNet with a ResNet baseline. So all the code is available 
available right here and it's all really nice. So this is in fast AI and it's really about this process. So about how do I know where I stand with my model and how do I know whether or not I improve? And if I improve, how do I know what it was due to? How do I know the causes, like which of the things that I turn made it better and how can I make it even more better? Is that a thing? Even more better? Even better. And along the way, you'll also obviously learn how to use weights and biases as an MLOps system, which is amazing because weights and biases is the greatest MLOps system in existence, obviously. And it's free forever for personal use and for academics and for open source teams like ours. Very thankful again. You should absolutely check it out. It's a great way to get started into a more principled approach into training and improving models than just hammering things left and right. So if you've never worked with weights and biases, this is a great opportunity to get into it. If you are at the beginning of your machine learning career and want to get into coding, this is also a great way to get into it. And if you just want to see kind of what the normal steps in a data science and machine learning engineering workflow are, this is also an absolutely great place. The course has several modules and builds upon itself. It's guided through, as I said, with live code examples, with videos that explain everything to you. All the code is available. And as I already said, it's free. So it's 1db.courses. Go there, check it out, and I'll see you around. Own this into HF inference. All right, let's open that in code. Now, actually, I had to make the, the VS code here uh, rather large so you can see something. So forgive me for the, the, the cramped space. So what's going on right here? All of this is the repo of the text generation inference. Now, it's divided into two parts. There is this web server right here. And uh, the other one is that Python part. So we're going to go into a little bit of a dive right here. So there is router. Now, router, I'm going to assume is that router part that's here called web server and then server here let's see that looks like python code so server i'm going to assume is not the thing that's called server here on the picture but actually the thing on the right hand side which is the grpc server grpc for those of you who don't know it's a remote procedure call remote procedure something by Google. That's why it's called G. So it allows you to communicate between different processes, essentially and call methods on another uh, server and then get back a response. Very much like HTTP, but more efficient and super duper cross-lingual. All right, so we have like a server here. That looks good. That looks very good. So let's analyze that a tiny bit. Here we have a generate uh, thing, a generate end point, I want to say. So here is serve, we are going to load a model right here, we're going to add a server, and we're going to add a gRPC server right here. And that's going to serve these different requests right here. So there's generate clear cache, there's generate with cache. So we want to start like in the very, very core. So let's follow this generate function right here. What does it do? It parses something from a protobuf, it then calls this thing right here, generate token. Okay, and this generate with cache also calls this generate token thing, except that it does some cache thing in front. So let's go into the generate token right here. So generate token is not implemented. This is just model. So let's figure out where we are. We are somewhere models model here. We are here. There are different models. The common one, this causal LM is probably the one we want. We don't want a specialized one. So what's in here? There's import torch. This looks very much, this looks like hugging facey. Here is a batch. Okay. This is the data structure that has a batch to protobuf from protobuf. This looks quite good so far. Okay. This is the data structure. Maybe there's something down here. Concatenate, yada, yada. Causal LM. Okay. So this is the model and on the model, there should be a method that says generate token. There it is. So this is what's being called from both generate and generate with cache from the endpoint. Remember, we are here on the right hand side, which is the hugging face code. So what does it do? It takes a batch and then it calls self dot forward once yeah, once. And then uh, what does it do with the results? So here is log it, log it. It packs them in into an iterator and it iterates over them. 
and then it calculates like log props and chooses next token and so on. So you might think that this iterator right here that iterates over the log it's is iterating over the sequence, but it's not. Remember, this just calls forward once on the model and we can even see what forward is forward here just calls model dot forward and you can see here it has like past key values these are cached values because in auto regressive language modeling you can cache a lot of stuff and uh, that's what it does so the iterator is not over the sequence length but over the batch and we're just creating one token at a time let me show you where that comes in handy so here we're saying this and then there is a stopping criteria. So we're going to go through the batch, we're going to have a batch of requests and we for we create one token for each member in the batch and then another token for each member. Now these generations, they will not be all of the same length at the end, which means that you know, for some of them, we actually need to stop generating earlier than for others. That's exactly what this stopping criteria here does. And if this stop is active, then I guess we decode the text, we calculate some token IDs and so on, log probs, and we append here, we append the generated text to the generated texts. And at the end, we return that return it here, or we return it down here. This happens inside of this iterator. So that means every time this generate token is called, we go through each member of the batch that isn't yet stopped, we generate the next token for it. And then we decide for each member whether or not it is stopped or not whether whether or not it should stop. If it should stop, we add it to this list of generated texts, which we return at the end of each step. So at the beginning of this inference for most members of the batch, that list is going to be empty for most steps, because that list is only going to contain for in each step is only going to return whatever members of the batch were finished during that step. It's kind of clear. So the list is returned each time, but it's mostly going to be empty. So this is our point of attack here. You see the list is returned. So there, there is a parameter next batch keep indices. This is for caching, right? So there is it returns none. And if that is true, then we do some computation about you know, which indices and so on for the next batch for caching. But we still you can see right here, we still return the generated text. <laughs> so since we create all the tokens, I think what we should do is we should simply return something more right here with each step. And that is for each member of the batch, the generated tokens, no matter whether it's finished or not. And then we can still return once they're finished, we can still return the full result at the very end. So we're going to stream, 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 stream. Once it's done, we're going to return the full thing. And then it's, you know, really done. <laughs> okay, so let's go after this generated text thing right here. What is that? That appears to be some data class as a two proto buff. We won't care about this right now. What we'll do is we'll simply make another data class right here. That's like intermediate, intermediate. We'll just call it intermediate. <laughs> So this here maps to the request because it needs to know which request it comes from. Since we're going to return whenever something is stopped, that list doesn't necessarily map one to one to the requests. I don't want to really put in the entire request every time we emit the token. So let's just say we're going to put the request ID here. I happen to know that that's a string. We'll look at that later. What and how and why and proto actually Let's look at it now. So in the protobuf definition, if you've never seen something like this, this protobuf is, is just you specify interfaces, data messages, you specify uh, APIs and so on. So here you can see request the ID is indeed not a string. So good that we looked it up. And the generated text right here, you can see that's the corresponding protobuf, you can see the request is of type request. Yeah, so request ID is an integer. Let's do that. That's an int. Good output text. No generated tokens. No. Now we could do a lot of things right here. But in essence, I just I just want I just want the token. We could give the log problem the token ID and whatnot. But for now, I just want the token. Uh, we can extend it later. All right. So let's make a list. Intermediates here. We'll import that. 
All right, let's see where we produce that. We produce that here if stop. The question is, I don't actually, I, wa I don't want it. I want it, I want to add it no matter whether stop or not. So here you see, we take the next token, we squeeze it a bit and we decode it. So now slowly we come into the question of we have to try it out somehow, right? We can't just sit here and just reason about it and think about it. This is Python after all, we're meant to run it. So there is a readme right here. And the readme says how exactly you can run this thing. So here it says, okay, uh, if you want to, if you want to develop it, you need to make these things. Actually, you probably want to make install first. So let's do it. Open the terminal. So this will build pretty much all the things. If you are working with Rust, I suggest you get yourself the Rust Analyzer. That's very neat. All right, all right, we're done with the first part. Make install. Then we make server dev. I think that's it. Server dev and router dev. By default, this loads like some, some blue model, which I don't necessarily want. So let me try to change that. Server dev here, make cd server make run dev so the make file of the server makes here serve big science bloom we don't want that that's kind of a a large model so we're at the hugging face hub let's see let's go text generation most downloads that sounds good we need something small distill gpt sounds to be decently small very small let's see it's 300 megabytes <laughs> how uh models models all right let's grab it distill gpt2 let's replace this all right here we go go back to our terminal we split it a bunch of times make server dev split it all right model name distill gpt2 <laughs> error fantastic it already starts absolutely great let's see what do we have sharded is not supported for auto model yeah we don't want sharded and 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 excellent we're running okay the server is running let's um split the terminal here make router dev this is going to compile some rust code and then start up this router and lastly if we split that again the readme here in case you can see it gives us a nice way of how to test it we can take this curl command so this says connected. So we'll plug the curl command here. Yeah, testing API, new line, new line, new line, new line, new line. If I do it again, I'll get the same. So the original text is testing API <laughs> and we're getting new line, new line, new line, new line, new line. That, that is a great response. Absolutely. So here you also see that that is the response. Everything works as we expected. So let's make this uh, great make this awesome. The first thing we want to do is actually we want to go in here and really see what this next token thing is. We're going to do some small, small optimizations and say next token squeezed is that and all right, like this. And we also need the result of this decode thing. So let's take that up here. Um, next token decoded and I realize there's a comma which is deadly in Python and we're going to print and my favorite thing to do is just to do this uh, so I can actually I can actually find it in an output especially if you have lots of output so we want to do that uh, let's bring up the terminal again look at that well there, there's nothing different because we haven't restarted it yet so the question is which one do we need to restart and I'm gonna guess the one on the left that's kind of the Python one kill it as hard as we can run it again we should be good as song as this says and it fails to bind to ah, it's 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 crashing okay why good we're up I guess it blocked its own port and start the router and then start the curl command and we should see 
we should see this thing right here. So there's a obviously this is the new line token, right? And then there is a tensor with one item. So this next token decoded is simply the token we're looking after. So that's very good. So we can simply add that to the intermediates. So intermediates append, we want to append actually an intermediate with the request ID equals the request ID. And I'm pretty sure that wasn't called request ID in the proto. It was just called ID. Yes. See here. So in protobuf, Python will actually generate a code for you, which is pretty neat. So these will just end up as Python objects that you can access stuff of and token equals the next token decoded. And that's good. So we append an intermediate and we go here to the return. We return the intermediates along with the generated text. Let's go to the next return statement. Also return that here. So whether it's with the next batch cached or without, we're going to always return these intermediates. So now we want to find out where this function is called. We now grab all of the tokens as they're happening and we return them every time as opposed to only returning the finished things. So we need to figure out where this generate token is being called. And as you can see, it's being called in a bunch of this is tests. We don't care about tests. Who writes tests? Tests are for wussies. Weak people write. <laughs> Sorry. Tests are fine. So here, as I said before, it's only here in the generate and the generate with cache methods here. Yes intermediates and let's let's see what what to do with them so that the second call is just down here right we'll deal with that later so what do we do with the fact when we get back these intermediates so this is packed into this generate response object and then sent and that's happening every time right even if that generated text thing is empty so we can abuse that we can just piggyback on that and also pass through these intermediates. So here we do that. And here I'm going to guess just the same. Yeah. So here also that would go come here and go here. Yes. Easy as that. All right. So we get these intermediates and we'll just go with the, like with the generated text right here. Let's say, yep. Generated text to intermediate copy paste. Excellent. And grab the intermediates here. Wonderful, wonderful. Now we have a problem, namely, this object here has no clue what we're passing into. Right. And this is one of these protobuf objects. As I said, protobuf, you define it in these proto files, and then the protobuf compiler will create the necessary objects for you in the languages that you desire, in this case, in Python. So it will make Python objects in order to interact with with protobuf. So it's like a code generation compiler. So you can just write your programming language, you and simply fill out fill up these these um, objects right here. So the IDE here is it's it's kind of an indie IDE. VS code. Not sure if you know it, but it doesn't seem to work too well with these generated things. Or maybe I'm, I was just I'm just incompetent at handling it. I'm pretty sure you can make it do some up. In any case, what we need to do is we need to find this generated text thing. Um, no, not the generated text here, generate response and generate with cache response. These two objects, they need to have next to generated text lists, they need to have intermediate list. However, these are of object generated text, which is this thing right here. Again, like we did in Python, we should make an intermediate intermediate. And this is you int request ID, we called it token request ID, token token. That's it. Now in the generate response, we grab this intermediate result. Why not? Intermediates, intermediate, da da da, copy, paste. Good. All right, so far so good. Now, as you might have seen there in the generated text Python class, there is a method to convert it to one of these protobuf objects. So we need to do the same thing for the intermediate. Now this is fairly easy. It's just take data, put data, but we need to implement it. Let's see. Yes. <laughs> ho, 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 ho. Go pilot. <laughs> I love when this happens. Wonderful, wonderful. So far, so good. Cool. Let's let's just, you know, let, let's just can we try it out? Where does this crash? That's my my question right here. Where can I see the, the terminal? I am a really not toggle pan. Ooh, ooh, what's that? Command J. Wow. 
<laughs> I, I legit did not know that. Okay, the question is, does this crash? And if not, can we make it such that somewhere we actually see this? So here, there's the generate response. I still don't, um, we're still not sure when the generate and when the generate with cache is called, right? So let's um, here print generate and intermediates and down here we print of course thank you copilot so let's print those stuff out and see what happens make the server make the router the router can't find the server the server is blocked on some port of course that is always lovely oh no okay so we get some error that's fantastic okay how about that failed something failed Okay, there is class intermediate is somehow not good, has no attribute intermediate. So we've only defined the protobuf. Now the make files aren't too comprehensive here. So we might need to start from the top and run make install again to actually compile the protobufs. While that's happening, we can actually confirm that that is make install goes into this install server. We go to the server make file. We see that here compile protos gen server gen server is run from install. Yes. So if we just run the server, it will not recreate the protobuf. So we need to run make install in order to create the protobuf definitions. Now here. Oh, yeah. See, here you see the generated things, they're in git ignore, but it's useless to try to read them because it's like, yeah, no. <laughs> this string right here is the generated thing. No, thank you. All right, we can just go ahead and make the server. Here, router. We need to wait for the server to be started. And fail to bind to address. Kill all Python 3. Let's see if you're still so unhappy. Oh, come on. Fail to bind. Well, I guess we'll just need to wait until that socket is free again. Come on. Well, okay, let's change stuff a bit. How about rock per node one? All right, that looks better. And make the router. All right, we have it back up and let's make our curl request. Bada boom. Okay, so we got a bunch of stuff right here. We get the same response. As you can see, I hope you can see, we do actually first get a generate request and then we get generate with cache after that for each token. So we need to be able to handle both, but it's good to know that it first calls the generate. And then I guess once it gets back a, a response and it does some caching, it then says generate with cache to, to use the fact that the cache is there. Yep, generate with cache. You also see the intermediates. The token is in fact that new line token, the request ID matches. I don't know exactly whether, oh yeah. Maybe here, not sure. You also see something interesting. The generate request, which we'll get to later, actually has this do sample parameter and sort of top K and temperature and so on. So this is what currently makes it deterministic. But later, we actually want to control the sampling parameters and also introduce a random C. But I don't know if we got to that today. So now we know how it works and we know what we're doing and so on. So let's go to the server thing where we have our print statements. This two P, this two protobuf also seems to work. There seems to be no complaints about that. So we have that Python thing done, right? The Python thing is pretty easy. And what also has become clear is that if we quickly go back to here, the Rust part here is calling the Python code for every single token. So it's like generate, get something back, generate with cache, get something back, generate with cache, get something back. So the actual processing of that outer while loop, which usually would also happen in hugging face code. But in this particular case, that actually happens happens inside the Rust server. So let's get rusty, as the kids say these days. We'll close all of that Python stuff. We don't, we're not gonna need it anymore. And let's see where the Rust stuff is. So here's the proto and I think here in the router. So every Rust project has this cargo. Tommel finds a bunch of stuff. You can see here the binary is at main. The lib um, is at lib, the main file to, to import. Let's see what happens at this, uh, there's a bunch of arguments, for example, tokenizer name. Oh, there's a tokenizer. Look at that. There is the server run. There is a client. The client is like awaited. That looks like something. I want to know where this here. Here is a generate request. Okay, that's one that comes from. And also we need generate with cache request. 
So generate with cache request. Here, this is the interface in the protobuf. We need to know where these two things are called. And it seems to be here. So in client.rs, there is generate with cache. It's a function. It takes in batches. It's a method actually of this client thing. So there is a thing called client, which we already saw before. And that's the thing that interacts via gRPC with the Python code. Connect, which is good. Service discovery, clear cache, generate. And here we see generate with cache. And these simply call the gRPC thing. So these are the Rust function that the Rust code would call. In here, these things in turn call the gRPC functions that run on the Python side. So here is where in this generate request, uh, the generate response that we get should contain intermediates. Let's try that out. So we'll just modify the generate thing right here and we'll print not the response, but intermediates. Let's let's see how that works. I just want to see. I'm not sure if we need to recreate the protos or something like this for Rust as well, but I just want to see how that works. Now, since we are not modifying the Python code anymore too much, this one, I want to make this one. I am, I suck, at, <laughs> I suck at this. All right, I don't actually need to show the whole. So I just need to restart this um, Rust part right here. And, okay, add a semicolon. Thank you. Rust compiler is very nice. If you don't know Rust, I didn't. Then I learned it. It's fun. Let's see. All right. Connected. Bada beam, bada boom. And you can see we have intermediate here. Excellent. So from here, we were actually able to print these intermediates that come from gRPC. Now we never defined anything in Rust to make that happen. And we were wondering where. So if you look at it, this is actually generated code that the protobuf compiler generates, puts here into the generate v1 rs thing. And you can see that no, here, this struct intermediate, this is a Rust struct. That that the protobuf compiler has made for us and that will be the result when we call the gRPC method. So there's a request ID and there is a token and hopefully the request ID up here that we get in is also a U64. Excellent. Cool. So we get these intermediates right here. Now we get really into Rust stuff. As you can see here, the return is the last line. If it doesn't have a, se have a semicolon, it's a return statement. Here you can see we return OK and then we return a two this OK here is a Rust construct that's called a result. The result can have either an OK value or an error value. So it's a bit different concept than just raising some exception. So your return type is always is result, not always, but in you can make it result, in which case the caller always needs to handle, well, if it is actually OK, then this, and if it's not OK, then I do something else. You can see right here, the return value is a result. This is the OK type. If you don't say anything, the error type, which would come here, is simply like a generic error. Oh, sorry, this this entire thing is the OK type. So if we want to return our response dot intermediates right here, the Rust compiler will hopefully tell us, wait a minute, that's not the correct type. I expected something else I expected. And then we need to change this up here. So we need to actually say, I'm going to return a vector of intermediate and then compiler is happy again. Again, here, response, intermediate, the result, the return type, we adjust. Cool. The question is, we have not actually imported this, but we have a star import here in all of the generated protobuf things. All right, we're one step closer. The question is now, obviously, where are these functions called, this generate function? And for that, Rust has actually pretty decent uh, support and IDEs. So simply say, show me all the references. There is only one reference. So this is in a thing that's called sharded client. So the sharded client calls the client. The sharded client has a generate function and a generate with cache function that in turn simply clone, uh, call the in the client thing. Now, again, our task is simply to pull through here what that is. So the imports here are actually explicit. So we need to, ah, okay. So that is unexpected. We can't import this. Mm -hmm. We can't. Unresolved import. That's interesting. Let's see. So generated text is a pub struct. Intermediate is also a pub struct. We should have no problem importing that. Maybe that will 
just go away by itself once we recompile. So let's see where that's returned, add the return type here and do the same down here. Now the problem is obviously we can't test that for a while until we actually are able to run it. Now we need to figure out where that sharded client is called. So it's gonna get more interesting, I promise. Go to references and this is called here in the batcher. So the batcher here it has generate and down here it also has generate. So it has a bunch of calls to the generate and maybe also here the generate with cache. It has a bunch of things. See here this goes into wrap future. This goes into wrap future and this goes into wrap future. So maybe we can do something here here. Here you see we'll, we get this which looks suspiciously like what we returned. So let's just try to intermediate and that is not known. Let's say where is the generated text? Let's just intermediate. Let's just try that. Let's see. That's the future that comes in. Future here. This also intermediates. So you can see right here these are the two values and that and here that should work, right? All of this, we simply drop the intermediates here or we actually we can print them, print them right here and we don't do anything with them. So now we are we have sort of a stable configuration or a configuration that should be stable. OK, no intermediate in the root question is, do we need to rebuild something? And so let's try. No. OK, unresolved import in sharded client unresolved import here. So from the crate, we can't import like the batch client. Do I need to somehow say which things are re exported? That's sort of beyond my level of rustiness. We, we just copied everything. Let's see, I have so here, there is a build RS. Now the build script in Rust, you, you just make a Rust script that's called on build. The problem is it's going to try to only rebuild when something changed. So the issue is maybe we haven't changed enough things. Not sure. Let's delete this. Let's delete this and just try to cargo build. No, no. No, no, th that's even worse. <laughs> uh, ah, okay, I figured it out. As I said, the client crate, crate is like module, is inside the router crate and the client crate decides what it exports. And it does that in this libRS thing, which so far I have not considered. So here we can see all the things that are exported. Now all that's left to do is intermediate at that here. Yeah, we're importing it anyway already. So this is the import and, and also the export by saying pub. That should fix our problems here. That should fix our problems here. That should make this run. And yes, it does. There wasn't a protobuf issue after all. Good. So the router looks like it's running. Yeah, we get something, something. Look at that. Nice, neat. So we get intermediates, these things, we get them at one place in this wrap future. Now, here is where the trouble starts, right? The 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 real deal, really troubly bubbly. We get them in this wrap future. Where was that here? Wrap future. Yes. So this is a future, as you can see. Now we're getting into asynchronous things, right? These are threads, they communicate, they are asynchronous, and so on. So how, what and why and what and how here you can see if you have we, we await this future we get these things and then we pass that through send generated now send generated on itself is taking the finished generated text it's taking entries that map request IDs to request entries and it, it sort of mushy bushes them in and, and responds but only for the finished ones we don't want that we actually want to make this for for all of the intermediates as well. So again, the strategy is we're gonna take this here. So we're gonna intermediates, we're gonna take a vec of intermediate, thank you, copilot, and we're going to pass it here, intermediates. Now, what do we do with them? Here you can see we 
iterate over the finished ones and then we send them to this thing. Here is where it gets interesting. This response TX right here, that is, as the IDE tells me, a sender. Now a sender is a concept in Rust of a, of a channel. You have channels, you have sender, receiver, and so on. This specifically, I think, is a one-shot channel. If you see here, the response TX is a sender and the sender is from a one-shot channel. So you open a channel, you listen, and your sender sends one thing and then the channel is closed. That's how you do cross-thread communication in Rust. Yeah, the question is, like, we can start doing the same thing. So intermediates into iter. By the way, if you see into in Rust, it's sort of the type conversion, also handles like movement of data and so on. And it's pretty cool, but I don't have the time to explain now. Copilot is gonna suggest a giant thing for me right here, but I really, I want a bit of control over this. So sorry, Copilot, but you can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the other cool thing, so this here, we're gonna we're gonna do a lambda function, and let's say what they do right here into iter for each. Yeah, so we're gonna do something for each intermediate result. This is a lambda, and you don't need to specify a type here because the compiler knows what type it is. And very often in Rust, you can just leave away the types, which is really cool. So the first thing they do now we get into the real batching. So the batcher has these entry things. It's called an entry, and an entry entry, we can quickly look at what that is. So an entry is just a map from U64 to 20. Oh, that's the entry. That's kind of like the, the database. An entry struct has a request, the response channel and some data. So the database keeps this these um, entries and we now need to get this entry from the database. Let's say this is how you do it. We just copy that pretty shameless. Now the output here has a request, but we don't have a request. We just have a request ID, which makes things actually simpler. So we say intermediate dot request ID. Here we get a complaint. It says I expected a reference to an integer and I got an integer. So we actually, or another reference, a borrow. And Rust is called a borrow. Rust is very good at knowing when data moves and when it doesn't move. And it doesn't let you do things that would jeopardize the safety, like the memory safety of things, which is a really cool feature. So, or it mostly doesn't let you, you can write unsafe Rust. But, um, and then this remove here gives us what's called an option. So an option is very similar to a result. An option is like optional in Python, where it can be something which in Rust it's called sum of something, or it can be none. So we'd have to handle both cases, but since we're relatively sure that none will never happen, which will be a bug, we can call this expect thing, which just means that this would actually panic if none ever happens. And panic is like super duper exception, everything crashes. You only really want to do this if you're sure that never happens. So we have that entry. And now here they build this big infer response and send that via the channel. We should replicate that instead of the infer response here. Um, there is, this is a, a struct. What we should do is we build our own struct that is like an intermediate response. Pop great struct intermediate response response and sure let's do that request id well the request id is already given we don't need that anymore in fact we would just need a string but we want to be able to extend that later so i'll just say that's a token which is a string that is never constructed that's fine i'm gonna probably derive debug derive these are macro or I think preprocessor directives not entirely sure in any case we let the response be not this infer response but we let it be the intermediate response and Rick no it just has the token which is the token from the thing we get okay all good it's just a bit of data processing so far now we have to send it via the channel and that's the problem so the response channel as i said is a one shot channel it means that it can only receive one thing let's see where it is constructed and why that's a problem 
So we go to references, we see where is that constructed in the batcher? Here, here it's constructed. So when the re when the infer is called from the web server, we append to the database, which is just this map, right? We append this entry with the response channel. The response channel is created up here and is a one shot channel. Once we have that, we are going to listen to the receiver. So this is the sender that we pass and we stay with the receiver and we just wait for the receiver to have data and then we return that data and the channel is gone. That's not gonna work in our case, right? In our case, we need to be able to continuously send data until it's finished. So how do we do that? We can either go from the inside out or from the outside in. Let's see. So in the entry, we probably need another channel right here. Now the one shot channel isn't gonna do it because that's one shot. So we need something better. So Russ, multi-producer single consumer channel. That's what it's called, like the standard channel. It, here is Rust by example. You can see here we make a channel that's going to give us a sender and a receiver. Yeah, that's essentially what we are going to need. So let's import the MPSC module. Let's see right here. We'll probably, we should go from the outside here where we actually create it. So also this Tokyo here, it's a library for doing like threading and channels. So let's try that. This is the response channel. So let intermediate X and intermediate make channel. And I want to make this an unbounded channel. So no limit. That means we can't just await it, right? But we'll care about that in just, just a bit. So in the entry now, we're going to pass next to the response transmitter. We're also going to pass an intermediate transmitter. Probably want to use this intermediate response right here. And we don't want to just do that. We actually want to return a result and not just a response by itself. Like if there's an error, we have to handle it. So error result intermediate response client error just like here right i'm gonna not do the whole doc string right here because i'm lazy yeah so when we construct this, this is obviously now a mistake we're going to pass in this intermediate transmitter right here okay so this is an unbounded sender and here we just have a sender that's obviously unbounded sender. There we go. And it's correctly says that it is never read. So let's go to where this is actually read. Where were we here? Yes. Okay. So here we don't know what to do with the response. Now let's just send it over via that channel, right? Let's grab the entry. Let's grab the intermediate TX and let's send this and this unwrap or Actually, we don't need to unwrap or but yeah, this will here returns again a result. And we again say here we don't say expect we don't want to crash. But if the receiver is gone, if the result is an error, we simply want to say, well, whatever, because the receiver is is gone. So we send here in this loop, we essentially send into the channel and the data flies away. Now we need to handle it on the other side. Um, how do we do that? We can't just a wait, right? We don't know how many are gonna come. So we need some sort of signal that it's now over. And that's where it comes in handy that we have this intermediate response right here. What we can do is we can say, well, here, this token is actually not a string. It's an indi there's also an indicator of whether it's uh, the, the, the end. So we're going to make a boolean is end. We're going to do that. And we're going to make that false most of the time. And we're going to make it true and just send empty string or something like this. We could make this optional, but then we'd always have to handle sort of the non optional case. So we'll simply say the response here is is end is false. And once we're done here, we're going to send an is end true. Ah, but we don't know the entry. Well, see now it gets it gets tricky. Yeah, we need to pull this through from way before because we call the hugging face code and it doesn't necessarily know. Does it know when things are finished? Ah, okay, no, here we know something is finished, right? So here we should send before we send the infer response, we should send a signal to the intermediate thing that it's actually done. So here we send 
okay, but we send intermediate response. Yes, 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 this is good. And string, there, there's, there's multiple kinds of string in Rust. Oh, come on. String from, from, yeah. Good. Don't know what's going on. So now we send is and false, right? And then as soon as this thing is finished, we get the corresponding entry and send, well, by the way, now no more intermediate things are coming. So you can proceed to listen to the actual response uh, channel. And therefore here, we can simply listen to the intermediate channel, the intermediate receiver. We can probably we need to do while true or something. Now blocking, receive a call, receive. I'll just let's just do that. Okay, so we can safely unwrap here. Can't borrow as mutable. Ah, the receiver is mutable. So we make this mutable. Unused result. So they here map the error. Let's just do the same handling of the result like this question mark question mark is pretty neat in rust very good just put question mark it will work promise so this is receiving actually one thing so we need to put this into a loop let's say so this here will give us an intermediate response right this is an intermediate response intermediate response now we need to put this into a loop and listen for as long as the is end isn't coming. So if intermediate response is end, I want to say break. Good. If it's not the end, let's just print it. Okay, let's print it even before and see what happens. We haven't run something in a while. Okay, has is never the trade debug is ignored during dead code. Okay. And we get an empty reply. This is a bug. <laughs> this is Oh no, the thing I said would never happen. It happened. Oh why? Oh why? We we actually ran into the into the this is this is a bug. Let's see. Unbounded sender is a bug. Oh, of course. So we remove we remove the entry because we're only gonna use it once in the original case. We actually remove the entry from the hash map and then use it. That's obviously not something we want. And in fact, we should see one output before that crash happens here. Yeah, one happened and then we removed it and then we didn't find it anymore. So good, good thing we noticed. So we don't want to actually remove it. We just want to get it. So I don't know, does hash map have like some sort of get? Get? Oh, yeah, cool. Um, get so it will not get us it will get us a reference to the entry whereas remove as you can see here got us the entry itself because we actually take ownership of the object and now with get we don't get ownership of the object we simply get a reference a borrow what it's called that should work now so we should be able to see all of these intermediates bam nice is and false 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 and then at the end true beautiful beautiful all right, let's we are on a roll. We're on a roll and we're not going to stop. OK, the question is now this is made request response from the outside. One request goes in here to infer response returns that we need to be able in between to send stuff out, right? Challenging. How do we do that? I propose again, we use channels. So let's see where is infer actually called. It's not called in this file. So let's go to references. It's called once in server twice, twice. So first it's called in liveness check. Okay, we can leave it at that. That's fine. And then it's also called in here. Look at that generate. There's a function called generate. There's none called generate with cache because that's kind of done internally, right? So there's a function called generate that calls infer here gets a response and then it ships that response out with yada 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 conversion bobbity bobbity boo headers something 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 response right this here is in fact the http server i'm gonna because here i define an http router and i attach to the generate path this function, this generate function. So what we want to do is we want to make another one. We want to keep the ability of the users to call generate as an HTTP request and get back an HTTP response. But also we want to have a function called like generate stream. And that should do a different thing. It should call generate stream. 
a different function. And it might not be the most beautiful thing in the world, but we're just gonna take all of this <laughs> and copy paste it and then make the bottom function here into the one that we want. So stream. Now we're gonna delete most of the stuff, right? Uh, this is just a concept for now. We can Im introduce it again. We don't want instrumentation on this stuff. So the result, we're gonna have to see how we do this. Yeah, okay, start time. I don't particularly care, but total time, queue time, time per token, headers, and so on. All of this is gonna drop. We'll make it really easy, really easy. So, um, yeah then details we don't need to return token details at all we just need this infer response right validate requests so details does details go somewhere yeah no 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 this input length validated request that goes into infer that seems fair that seems quite fair there is a permission like model is overloaded that's fine too start time isn't needed anymore okay so now let's worry about what we actually need to return here we return a generated text and that generated text comes from this lib rs that's then serialized to json to be sent out we want to return not this but we want to return we want to return intermediate let's just call it like that and let's make this a token and that's that cool so we want to respond that however we don't want to respond Bonds with like respond with an HTTP response. We want to respond with a server sent event stream. So this here uses Axum, which is like a Rust HTTP or a Rust web server. We're gonna try to search for Rust SSE and we find the documentation, you can see that we simply return a stream. This gets into a little bit of the weeds, but essentially we return a stream. We need to return this SSE right here so that the server knows essentially what it, that it shouldn't return an HTTP response. So generate stream here should not return a result, but instead should return SSE. And you can see Rust is very helpful. Thank you. SSE of something that implements stream. Stream. Yes. The item is a result. Yes. Of event. And event is again from SSE. Event or infallible. So this is not going to fail. All right. So what we need to do, we need to return one of these. And you can see immediately some of these question marks popping up red. And that's because we are not handling errors anymore correctly. So there's multiple things we can do. And the easiest is just to ignore them. <laughs> Don't do this at home. But we just say expect and we just crash whenever an error happens. Can we can we not do that? Can we unwrap? No, why not? Okay, now let's just assume this is never overloaded. Problem solved. I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure expect should like work. All right, it works here. I'm, I'm not sure why it didn't, didn't above. We can like, we can, we can try here. It said what? It said that this thing right here hasn't, doesn't have debug. It could have debug. All right, good, good. I, I want to expect here. Okay, this here. Now, what we should do is we should actually send some sort of error event, right? We should define some sort of protocol where we send, but we no, we don't wanna we don't wanna do this. We just wanna assume this never ever fails. So good. Then here, expect inference error. That's fine. Okay, now it comes to so our event data that we wanna send is this is this we have this generated text right here right and we have this intermediate just below we import this we create that intermediate so that's infer response we'll see in a bit how we do this we'll see technically yeah i don't know yet exactly what we have to return is a stream and here you can see how to make such a stream so this is a stream that will just say hi a lot of times. Import. Let's do that. Import. Does this work? Why not? Declared duration? No. 
This should work. Ah, good. Import. Yeah. Stream is the wrong stream. So this, we got futures, we got Tokyo. Use futures stream. How about this? Does it work now? Um, we should probably also import some stuff. This we have this here, Tokyo stream, maybe. And this. Ah, okay. I see. How about we import this and Tokyo stream doesn't exist. And here I have less and less of a clue what I'm doing. Yes, self and stream. Okay, so we don't have Tokyo stream. If we go here to Axum feature flags, Tokyo features full. Okay, do we have Tokyo here features full? How about that? How about that? Look at that. It works. <laughs> I have no clue what I, I mean, probably I can remove those. But there are if we go to Tokyo stream net here, enables Tokyo net types and stream have been moved into the Tokyo stream crate. Ah, uh, no, it doesn't work. Okay, so there is a Tokyo stream crate, which we can install Tokyo stream 0111. All right, that's gonna that's gotta be it. So we remove this here. And we're going to go we're gonna go. We're gonna go here to the router. And we're gonna say cargo add Tokyo stream. All right, let's see whether that fixed anything. It seems it did. But we still have problems. Import stream futures. Yes, I think I did this wrong. Yeah. Okay. If we did everything correctly now, then we should technically get a stream that just says hi, hi, hi. But we have to call not the generate endpoint. If we call generate, we get our usual thing. But if we call generate stream, see, hi, 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 <laughs> we get back a stream. Nice. So th this is this is like a, we are now continuously listening until the server caps like cuts the connection, which it doesn't do because it, it just goes on forever. But this is how we make a stream. This is pretty neat. So how do we use that? What we need is we need the channel and we need to make it into a stream. So first of all, with this infer right here, I want to actually I want to put in a channel. So the channel I don't want to create in the infer, but I want to create the channel outside and pass it to infer. So infer is going to take an optional channel or we could make some infer stream, which is also possible. I opt for the easier thing, I guess. <laughs> so here I want to say this takes intermediate. Um, but the problem is, does my plan work? No. Uh, Mm. So let's assume we create the channel out of this, then we run this. And since this is async, we will never get to like the notify point. Okay, I haven't made up my mind yet. But let's try it out. So we pass in this intermediate uh, channel. So TX, which thank you, unbounded this, that's perfectly fine. And then we create this out here, right? So here, let's create that channel to listen to. I have a feeling that's this isn't gonna go too well as we are awaiting a whole bunch of stuff. No, this is definitely not gonna go well. Um, yeah, no, not gonna go well. So we need a infer stream function that acts as a pendant, that's a fancy word to the infer. So infer um, stream, this doesn't actually need to be async. So infer stream simply makes the request and returns. What does it return? It doesn't return a response. It actually just enqueues this doesn't do this whole looping doesn't do this, it just notifies the task. And it returns, I want to say, maybe, maybe it can return the intermediate, the intermediate and the response channels. Yep, yep. So we are going to return these two. Fine. That sounds re reasonable ish. Now here, this is no longer reasonable ish. Where's the mistake? Where is the mistake? Here's the mistake. So the entry here, 
Um, actually, let's make that option. Let's make that here, infer, make that none. We don't need it. Yes, option. Ah, and let's not have this loop here. In fact, let's have that in somewhere here. We'll decide later where, where what to do with it. But let's only do this if we have actually a channel. If let tx let sum. That's fine. Perfect. So we only send if there is a channel. Otherwise, we, we don't. That seems reasonable ish. Good. Now up here, obviously, we have this some. Okay. And now it's not happy with us. This is slowly getting complicated. So it is not happy about the return type here. And I probably was a bit too quick. So the return type, we want the intermediate one to be an unbounded receiver over intermediate, I guess, the uh, infer response. I see, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Result of infer response. And this is then result of intermediate response. How about that? Now we are good. Okay, so now the server needs to handle all of that. So in generate stream, we first validate all of this. Um, this we can on comment here, we need to call infer stream with this and we don't get a response. In fact, we get two channels. So we don't need this, we don't need that, we don't need this. We in fact, want intermediate receiver and response receiver. Good. And now we do we do the loopy loop. So we do this, we put it here, we uncomment it and import, import that maybe. And here we have a response, intermediate response. Again, we obviously simply make this really easy for ourselves. And we delete this. Okay, unbounded receiver is mutable. We should get all the intermediates and then we should get a stream that says hi, hi, hi. Let's do this. Let's get our curl ready. And okay, so we get this and then we say hi, hi, hi. Excellent. So now the only thing that's left to do, we're trying to get this channel responses into this stream thing. Now I for one, I have no clue how to do this efficiently, but I'm pretty sure the internet does. So there we go. So in Tokyo stream, there is async stream. That seems like, so here is a channel and we make that into a stream. It seems okay. <laughs> uh, we'll copy this um, here. Let's install it. Cargo add async stream. Yes. Good. Thank you, Cargo. Okay, so all we need to do is we need to do the intermediate receiver, we receive stuff from it. And now obviously everything goes, everything goes woo, woo, woo. Why? Why is that? Mismatch resolving async stream impl future found expected found expected intermediate response found event. So we have to translate this item into an event. What is the item? The item is an intermediate response or an error. So again, we don't worry about error handling. Uh, let so let's say let response equals item dot expect. Sure. Now we need to return an event event. Does that work? No, that doesn't. That can't work. How about event? What do we need for this event? We'll just go till we find an example that does it for us. Where do we get an event? There we go. Event. Ah, we had that before. How dumb. How dumb. 
mi event default and we just we want to transform this into json so let's json how about that struct json from request no we don't have a converter to json for this we need this shared json and we need to string from that okay use JSON. All right. Still not good enough. How? How? Type mismatch. Async stream as stream expected. Event found result of event. So this gives us an event. We need a result of an event. How about we yield OK of this? Wow, almost. Serialize is not implemented for intermediate response. Ta -da. Serialize is not implemented, but it is. It is. I see it right here. Ah, oh, this isn't. This is intermediate. This isn't intermediate response. So, um. like this and we'll do that. How about this? Hmm? Cannot find intermediate resp like this. Oh, come on. Yes, that's that. Oh, intermediate. I'm getting stupid. Well, this is all fine. okay. So we get the channel. We convert it to an async to a, to a stream, right? We read from the intermediate channel, and we yield okay, and we get an event with the data. That's this here is an SSE event. This is a stream of events, and now we return the stream down here. So this was a long thing, but hopefully, hopefully. If everything worked out correctly, which it always does in programming, we compile this, okay? And then we should get back just the intermediate events and we deal later. Okay, we, we don't get, we don't get anything. We get the tokens over here because we print. Oh, look at that. We still have the, the loop thing here. Of course, we exhaust the channel right here, right? We don't need this loop thing. So here we get, we should get the first, we should get the very, oh no, while, yes, while some item. Okay, item is what? Intermediate is, 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 is what? What type is it? Intermediate response. Ah, so we need to check whether it's an end. If is end, then break. If this works. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> so instead of uh, iterating through the channel beforehand, we now iterate through the channel in this uh, async stream right here. And as we do, we emit uh, these tokens. And if we are at the end, we just break the connection, at which point the client knows. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if in the parameters here, we specify, for example, um, do sample and we say that's false then we get the same thing but if we say do sample is true then we get different things look at that with x i o soy seven and something <laughs> nice so it would obviously be neat if at the end we get also the full response, right? Which we can also do. So after this while loop, we could go into another while loop that goes, that just waits for the response, like for the response channel. Uh, this, this, whichever we're getting, uh, we don't need these details. Um, yeah, this response channel right here, and we could convert that to JSON as well and send that. Um, but in essence, that's it. That's 
that, that's that's that we now converted we pulled all the way through from the hugging face code via grpc via the rust batcher via streams and asyncs and channels up until server sent events um yeah. Now I just want to show you, as I said, I've pulled this further. So we were only doing this part right here in, in the picture up until this server sent events right here. If you pair this with WebSockets and Redis and user right here, you can do pretty cool things. So in the open assistant repo, I have the inference folder and there is like a script that opens a tmux. So you need tmux, you need docker, but this will open a bunch of panels right here on the left side is a redis this here is the server we just built packed as a as a docker container also with distill uh, gpt here is our own inference backend that does the routing between workers and users as i said workers can be anyone on the world can essentially plug their worker into our system via a web socket so here now you can see we've loaded up the model yes so we are connected this has no pending task this is a worker that runs this right here so the worker is connected to this and connected via websocket to this and here on the very uh, side over i have the user and that's a little text front end so i want to want to show you what happens when i type something here hi how is it going and what you get is a streaming output as the tokens are produced. I have a little prompt here that <laughs> that is essentially a user assistant conversation, but it's this still GPT-2 and I don't do termination. So you can see when here, you, this is actually output from the model. <laughs> Tell me a joke. Let's see. <laughs> So that's what you get. You get a super distributed network where anyone can plug in their GPU to the system. We have the central thing with Redis and people run at home. They run this 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 uh, inference server that we just built and all of it is streamed. So whenever that thing produces a single token that is streamed via gRPC, via Rust, via server sent events, via WebSocket, via Redis, and again via server sent events to this client right here, which obviously then could also also be your browser and that is the final thing that we wanted to get yeah uh that's that's um it <laughs> thank you for being here uh i know this was long let me know if you want more of these coding videos um we get into the depth of things and figure out what we need to do where as i said video on open assistant is either already out or will be coming soon thank you so much for being here i'll see you around